never even run a four hour marathon, but that's where I'm at. And I have to meet myself where I'm at. And how do I feel when I run and how do I feel when I complete a race? I feel proud of myself. This is Running For Real, the podcast for runners who know that for every runner's high, there are just as many lows. All those just missed PRs, easy runs that feel hard, injury blues, and more. Each week, we'll talk to running, health, and wellness experts about their highs, lows, and best advice to build our confidence. Running For Real is about being honest, being brave, and most of all, not feeling alone. And now here's our host, who mosquitoes find quite delicious, Tina Muir. Hello, my friends. Welcome to episode 83 of Running For Real. I am so thankful you are here today. And did you hear the news? I know it was a few weeks ago now for many of you, but we hit 1 million downloads of the Running For Real podcast on the 1st of October. 1 million. I can't even get my mind around that. But you, my dear friends, are the ones who have made that happen. When you've told your friends, when you've screenshotted a picture on your phone and shared it to social media as you're listening to it, by telling your running groups, and of course, by subscribing to the podcast through your favorite podcast player, you have helped me get there. So thank you so much. And for that, we have giveaways galore this week. So be sure to check out my Instagram at Tina Muir 88 and my Facebook page, facebook.com forward slash real Tina Muir for more on what you can win. We have a lot of goodies from previous guests. So good luck. Now, last week we talked to Derek Murphy of Marathon Investigation, you know, the website that outs cheaters and races. And honestly, I was a little unsure before the episode as it seemed like it was such a negative topic to focus on. But actually, it was fascinating to learn more. And as it turned out, Derek wasn't actually the mean man I had in my head who just wanted to victimize people. But he actually really wants it to be a positive thing eventually. So if you missed that one, be sure you go back and check it out. Be sure to subscribe so that future episodes come to you directly. And I don't need to remind you. So today, are you an artist Are you creative? Are you talented at drawings or paintings or sculptures? No? Well, me neither. And I've always had a vision of what I want to come out onto paper or onto some kind of model or something. But then it just ends up looking like nothing even close to what I hoped for. And I end up mad because I just don't feel like I did myself justice. That being said, even if you are the king or queen of awkward stick figures like I am, that doesn't mean art can't feature in your world. And I'm fascinated with my guest today and just in complete awe with what she is doing. Laurie Richmond is a children's author and illustrator and also known for her view from my run features that have been covered by Runners World and New York Road Runners. And it's such a cool idea. And you're about to learn more about that. But before I do, I just want to give a big shout out to everyone who has supported me on Patreon so far. I work so hard on everything I do for Running For Real and your support means a lot. I want to give a special shout out to Dustin Ward for his generous support. Dustin actually gets to pick a guest who I will interview in a few months and you will be hearing from them soon. If they want to come on my show, of course. You too can also get extra perks, including knowing who is coming up to six weeks in advance. That's even before my editor, Jeremy, gets to know. And you get to ask your questions to my guests by visiting patreon.com forward slash running for real. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com forward slash running for real. Or you can find the links through my Tina Muir website and I'll explain more about what it is there. Right, let's go meet Laurie. Thank you to Body Health for sponsoring this episode of the Running For Real podcast. I am so thankful to Body Health and their support, not just of this podcast, but of me through their perfect amino products. They help me recover faster and feel better. You too can get 10% off at bodyhealth.com using code TINA10. You know I genuinely care about the brands that I choose to share with you. That's why I turned down a big brand recently as I really dislike their product, so I backed out. But I'm so excited to introduce you to a new sponsor, Bomber Socks. It is just in time for marathon season and I'm always telling you that you need to practice with your outfit before the day. Well, now's the perfect time to get some new socks to wear on race day and I'll tell you about why I love them so much later in the show. 
Laurie, thank you so much for joining me on the Running For Real podcast. I am really excited to have you on today. Huge fan, as you already know, and I've put on my social media many times that my daughter loves what you do. Uh, We're going to talk about that in just a second, but firstly, welcome to the show. Oh, thank you for having me. I'm a fan of yours as well. And it's so fun to chat with you. Yeah, this is going to be really fun. Now, um, I mentioned just then that, you know, my daughter loves your work and uh, I would love for you to say in your own words, kind of tell us what exactly you do. And then I'll go on to explain what I meant by that in a second. Sure, of course. So I am a children's author and illustrator. So I make picture books for kids And my target audience is, you know, somewhere between ages two and eight. Um, But picture books are really for all ages. So it's just a joy to make content for children. Um, And that's how Bailey knows my work. Yep. And uh, we were lucky enough that Laurie sent us three books all signed. And by the way, Laurie, I haven't told you this. Every time we read the book, uh, it's usually Steve reading to her in the evenings. He'll say to Bailey, you know, keep keep moving up or something love Laurie and he reads it every time oh that's so cute I love that (laughs) thank you for sharing that that's really sweet it's it's so cute and um you know we do really love those books she loves it and I in particular love one which I know is important to you um called uh is it uh, bunny staycation or yeah. mama's business yeah. trip, yeah. Um, which is about, uh, like you mentioned to me, the role reversal of the mother going away for a business trip and the dad staying behind, which I love reading to her, hoping that she can get the, the hidden message there that it'll be okay if mummy does go away for a few days in the future. But okay, so let's talk about what you do. Um, you know, you mentioned illustrator and author. So what does that involve? You know, in I think for most of us who probably have absolutely no idea what an illustrator slash author does, uh, in my head, you kind of, you know, sit at a desk and draw some pictures and then give them in. But tell us, you know, obviously it's not quite as simple as that. It's not a case of here's a book, draw a picture and then submit it the next day. Tell us what it involves. Sure. I mean, we could have a whole podcast just about that topic. Um, <laughs> And actually, before I get into that, I do want to mention that I'm I'm a career changer. So mm. my whole career was not always uh, in children's literature, mm-hmm. but um, for the first 20 or so years of my career, I was always in um, a creative field. I was a creative director for a lot of corporate companies. Okay. And then when I turned, um, I was roughly 39 years old, I believe, when I decided to just like take a leap off the cliff and change what I was doing. And I was always involved in you know, art as a kid, um, and sort of, you know, went back into it when I was getting frustrated with my day job, but, um, making picture books for kids, you can do it a couple of different ways. So um, can I just pause you before yeah, you go on? Sure. You said you decided to jump off a cliff. Had that been something in your mind for years and, you know, something finally snapped in you and you're like, you know what, I need to do something else. Or was it kind of a gradual, you pulled away slowly and then, Um, you know, started adding other things in and then eventually pulled away from the job? It was a little bit of both. Uh, What I was doing was I was managing a team of people. Um, I was a senior manager in the company. We were making websites. We were making uh, mobile apps. I was doing corporate branding, um, websites for advertisers. We were sort of an in-house agency um, within the company that I was working for. And because what I was doing at that point was mostly digital work, I was sort of looking back on, you know, say my last 10 years at the company and I didn't feel like I had a body of work because when you work in the digital space, things are constantly changing, you know, websites relaunch, apps go away, new apps come. And I didn't feel that I had a body of work that I could point to and say, you know, I made this, Mm. there wasn't anything I could, I could hold in my hand that was tangible Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, show my kids 20 years from now and say, you know, that I made that. So it was that, you know, sort of, um, just discontent and a little bit of frustration with what I was doing on a daily basis that led me after hours and, you know, on weekends and stuff to kind of go back to my roots and start pursuing more of the fine arts again. And I wound up taking some workshops and some classes specifically around surrounding children's books and really fell in love with that. And then I kind of had an 18 month, I would say exit plan Mm. that I, that I made for myself, um, you know, to kind of set myself up to be able to walk away from what I was doing in my day job and then work for myself, which is, you know, how I wound up where I am now. Mm -hmm. And you were saying before about, you know, the, the process of being, becoming a children's illustrator. 
or are you yes. trying to do? So there's a couple of different ways that you can go about it. There are some, um, create book creators that they just write the words and they are not artists. And then there are people that are artists, but not writers. And then there's people like me that do both. Um, but children's publishing is a very small field and the barrier to entry is pretty high. Um, everyone has an idea for a children's book and it's kind of one of those, those things that you always find on somebody's bucket list. Everybody Mm. says like, you know, I want to publish a book or I would love to make a children's book. And I think especially after you have your own kids or you spend time around children, it's just one of those things that is so joyful and makes you want to create it. Um, but there are, you know, organizations uh, like the Society of Children's Book Writers and Illustrators that have a lot of information on how the industry actually works. Um, you know, literary agents represent you and and submit your work to publishers. So there's a lot of different um, p- moving pieces to actually, you know, getting a book deal and making it happen. Mm-hmm. Okay, cool. And uh, you know, what about from when you decide you want to? you know, write a book or you have an idea in mind for you. I'm not talking about someone doing this for the first time. How long does it take for one book to, you know, if you were going to, you, maybe you could give us an example of each, if you were going to write and illustrate, and if you were just going to illustrate. It really depends. There's a huge range. I mean, I can use bunny staycation as the example. So I would say from the time that I had the original idea uh, like conceptually of the, what I wanted the book to be about to, you know, working on the whole project, submitting it to the publisher, working through revisions and actually seeing it on a bookshelf is, was about four years. Wow. Okay. Yeah. It's, it's a glacially slow industry. Um, but you know, you'll talk to people that they've been working on an idea for 10 years and, you know, then you'll hear the occasional story. Oh, I, I woke up in the middle of the night and I had an idea and I, I wrote this manuscript in 30 minutes and then, you know, sold it the next day. So there's really not a hard and fast rule because it's, you know, it's the creative process. It's not something that you can really plan out. Um, but I would say once you actually have a project with a publisher that's been acquired, it's roughly a year and a half to two years from, you know, that point in the process to actually seeing it on the shelf. Oh, okay. And, you know, I'm not meaning to offend or kind of put my foot in my mouth in any way here, but like a child's book, you know, may have, I don't know, uh, it could have maybe just 10 sentences within, within a book, particularly the ones like the, uh, board books for, you know, babies. Um, you know, how can it take, you know, you mentioned about the story itself, like what is the process of going like back and forth? Like, you know, in my head, you know, you think of a a big long book and it's, you know, thousands and thousands of words that you have to analyze each word, but with such a short book, what is, what is kind of holding back? Is it a lot of going back and forth to make things rhyme, make things kind of uh, align with the words that children would be using of that age? What are some of the things you have to think about? Well, picture books have a very specific format. So the vast majority of them are 32 pages and most modern picture books, the manuscripts are 500 words or less. So the economy of words and the word selection in picture books is really important Mm. because in a very short amount of space um, and words, amount of words, you need to have character development. You need to have a story arc. You need to have, um, you know, the the understanding of the challenge that the character is facing. Um, then you need to have a resolution and that's really hard to do in a very short amount of words. It's actually, when you have a lot more words to work with in a longer format, one would argue, you know, it had, that has its own challenges, but because you have more words, it actually makes it a you know easier in some ways mm. Be- because I am writing and illustrating. Um, my perspective is not just from the words; it's also visual. So I really have to pay attention to what the story is that the images are saying that is not in the words. And that's really the beauty of picture books: is that so much of the story also mm-hmm. comes from the visuals. Yep. And I find that once I get to that point in the process, as I'm working through an idea, the more images I add, the more words I remove because I don't really need them anymore because the pictures are doing the, you know, doing the work too. All right, cool. Well, thank you for explaining that. And uh, I just wanted to kind of go into just what you do, because I'm sure, you know, although this part isn't about running, uh, it's something that we 
you know, in most of us in our day to day life would never come across someone who is an author illustrator for children's books. Or maybe maybe we are if, like you said, there's so many people want to do it. And finally, uh, before we move on, what what would be the the dream job for for an illustrator author of a children's book? Like, is it a New York Times bestseller? Is it working with a I don't know celebrity for their book? Like, what well, what would be the dream? Well, it's funny that you brought up those two things because those are something that's totally out of your control. Like the New York Times list is this weird, elusive, you know, um, process that happens and nobody really understands like how they actually choose those books. And, the, you know, the deep, dirty secret is that a lot of times it has nothing to do with like the amount of books necessarily sold. It's, mm. it's which particular stores report their sales. And so I don't pay attention to that. And, um, you know, being paired with like a celebrity book and stuff, that's, you know, that's something that would happen on the publisher side. Again, that's not something you can control, but I would say the the dream is first getting a book deal to begin with, mm -hmm. like having your work validated in that way. And then the first time you actually get to share your book with kids and see them react to your mm. work in a positive way, because picture books are so, you know, intimate and they're shared with you know, like you're saying your husband shares with Bailey at bedtime in these really intimate moments between parents and children. So, you know, seeing that happen with your work, that's really the best thing that you could ask for. Cool. Okay. Thank you so much for explaining. All right. Yeah. So let's talk about more of a running related topic. Um, before we get into that, tell us about um, your journey to become a runner because you weren't always a runner. How did it kind of come about no. for you? No, I am a self-proclaimed... Um, fitness failure turned, <laughs> turned runner. So, you know, I was the art kid growing up. We had a thing in our elementary school and our middle school called the presidential physical fitness test. I don't even know if they still administer that exact like assessment, but you would, you know, be called up one at a time. And in front of the whole class, you had to like hang from a bar, you know, for 10 seconds or run around the track. And how many sit-ups could you do in 30 seconds? And I would just failed miserably. It just was not my jam. And so I had it in my head my whole life. Like I'm not an athlete, you know, that's not my thing. And so I, you know, on the flip side, I was the one being commissioned, you know, to make people student council posters for the mm -hmm. election and stuff. <laughs> but then when I turned 39 around the time of my career change, I, you know, I, I was approaching the big, you know, decade birthday of turning 40. And I really had this moment of, oh my gosh, like I should probably do something to take care of my health. You know, now I've, I've sort of taken charge of my career. You know, I've left my job. I started this new venture. What can I do for myself now for my, my physical health? Um, my sister was always a runner. And so she would always, you know, be someone that I admired and looked at for, you know, for that and her accomplishments. And I was sharing a studio space with people that were also runners. Um, and coincidentally, I was sitting next to the guy in my studio. His name is Josh Clark. He wrote the original Couch to 5K program like <sighs> 20, 20 years ago. And that was how I started. I downloaded a Couch to 5K app. I walked over to the you know running store and I bought some shoes and I just started doing it. And then after I you know completed that program at the you know, sort of pressure of some of my studio mates, I signed up for the Brooklyn half marathon. So my first road race was a half marathon. Wow. <laughs> Pretty intense. Yeah. But you know, I loved it. I, I loved the challenge of, you know, not being sure I could do it and then putting in the work and, you know, didn't care about my, my pace or anything. I just was like, I want that medal. I want we, you know, to end at Coney Island. Yeah, that's that, where the, I've done that race. That's a really cool one it's to start super with. Super fun. Yeah. And yeah, so after that, I was I was totally hooked. <laughs> yeah, and and rightly so, especially with that race. I that one for anyone listening who hasn't done it, the Brooklyn Half. Um, it's a point to point, and you do this loop in the first bit. That's kind of some hills, and um, and then you go basically out all the way to the ocean, right? And yeah. uh, you finish uh, along the beach, like literally on the boardwalk. So it's definitely a fun one. And there's, you know, a lot of celebration going on afterwards. So um, really cool to hear that. And obviously it's become a part of, um, you know, who you are and and, and what you do. And um, I have a question from one of my um, Patreon uh, members who wants to know, like, you know, what 
what inspired you to kind of blend the two, um, your art passion and your running passion? Um, because, or actually, let's firstly kind of talk about, you mentioned earlier that um, you'd always been kind of the art kid. And mm-hmm. for me, you know, before I kind of met you or actually before reading the book um, Mindset by Carol Dweck, I didn't kind of think that it was possible to become both. Or I thought you were either creative and kind of an artsy person or you were a running kind of person. So what has been your experience with, you know, you do have both of these things that you enjoy in your life and there is space for both of them. So tell us about how that how that can be the case. Yeah, it was kind of an unexpected way. So as I said earlier, working on picture books, it's a very long process. Mm So um, a couple of years ago, I think I was working on three different books in the same year, which is a lot. And I was just feeling super burnt out, you know, from doing all that, all that work and just spending so much time like on these projects that I knew I wanted to do a side project, just something for fun, something Mm -hmm. totally different, exercise, a different part of my brain. And when I was out running and and training for these, um, half marathons, I would, I would think a lot about my projects that I was working on. And I found I was doing a lot of problem solving during my runs. Um, you like my brain would kind of get unstuck. If there was Mm -hmm. like a layout that I couldn't figure out, suddenly what I was running, I'd be like, Eureka, you know, Mm -hmm. I know how to solve that problem. And so I would think a lot about how my training was paralleling my artwork And so, um, you know, the whole idea of, you know, imposter syndrome, where all artists have it, you know, we're on Instagram, we're looking at everybody's posts. We're like, you know, my art's terrible. And then the next day we're like, my art's great. And then the next day we're like, my art's terrible. And, you know, you kind of always feel like everybody else has it figured out and you don't. And I would think about, you know, running in a race and I'd see somebody next to me and either they're passing me or I'm passing them and how I would feeling, you know, I don't know, maybe that person that's passing me, maybe they were like their college track star. You know, how could I compare myself to that? I don't know anything about them. Mm -hmm. I just need to stay in like the present moment and think about what I'm doing right now and not worry about the people next to me and just like enjoy and feed off their energy and kind of, and that really made me think about how I would compare myself to other artists and how I should like apply those things, Mm -hmm. you know, um, to both practices So as I was thinking about all these parallels, I was like, oh, maybe, you know, there's a project I could do with my running, but I wasn't really sure what that was going to be yet. Mm -hmm. So one night I was out on the Manhattan Bridge. I know. Have you ever run over the Manhattan Bridge? Which one's the Manhattan one? It's next to the Brooklyn Bridge. It's a little bit north of the Brooklyn Bridge. I've run across one of them. I'm not sure which one it was. (laughs) Well, the the Manhattan Bridge, I think, has the best views because you get the views of the Brooklyn Bridge, which is really nice. And and there was a sunset and it was just so beautiful. It was one of those like, I love New York moments. And I just stopped in my tracks and I took a photo of this sunset and I kept running and I was like, oh, maybe I'll do a little, you know, painting of this when I get home and use my watercolors and it'll be really fun. And as I was checking my watch it occurred to me that if I painted the sunset in the same amount of time that I was out running, it would connect those two things. Mm -hmm. And I was like, maybe that's my side project. I'm going to do a whole series of artwork where I'm going to time myself as I'm painting to do them, you know, something I see on my run in the same amount of time that I'm doing the run. And then that was kind of the birth of the project. Mm -hmm. Which you now call view on my run or view from my run? you from my run. You from my run. And, yeah. uh, you know, it's kind of become a bigger thing. You've done a talk at the new, one of the New York Roadrunners events, correct? To kind yeah, of talk I did. About it? Yeah, exactly. I did a talk at New York Roadrunners. They did a little um, exhibit of my work and I've done a few um, like mini art classes and fun runs with them. And I've done one with Harlem Run. I'm doing one with um, Creative Mornings, which is actually a creative organization for like designers and artists, not runners. So Mm -hmm. kind of introducing it in that space too. But it's been really fun to see how people um, are really open to the idea of trying it, even if they don't consider themselves, you know, artists, Mm -hmm. even though I believe that everyone, you know, has an artist inside of them. Um, But yeah, it's a really, you know, kind of fun, fun way for me to combine the two things. And people have reacted really, really positively to it. Yeah, it's really cool. And I'm looking forward to in a minute, just diving into some of more of the questions of the specifics to do with that. But before we go on, you just mentioned there that you believe everyone is an artist. You know, I told you a few minutes ago that um, I read the book uh, Mindset and she talked about how, 
you basically can excel or do well at anything you want to do. And she used specifically Carol Dweck, um, a example of art and drawings. And she sewed self portraits of people who drew a self portrait and then did a course, a five day course and what their self portrait looked like five days later. And it was incredible seeing the difference because the one, the first pictures looked like what I think I would draw. And, you know, this is me saying I can't draw. I'm, I'm terribly terrible at creative stuff. Um, but seeing the difference of these people, what they drew afterwards was kind of like, you know, you could obviously tell they weren't people who have that, you know, just natural mind's eye, but they had had the, the, the work and the time to, to develop some of those abilities to be able to make it look really good. And, um, so what would you say to people like me or other people listening? You know, you said everyone has the artist in them, but people like myself are going to say, well, I just can't. If I was going to draw a picture, I'd just draw a stick person. Like how, how does everyone have it within them? Well, I think there's a couple of different ways to answer that question. So I'm going to uh, attempt to answer it in a couple of different ways. Whenever I, I work with children with my picture books it's always amazing to me to see how fearless they are in their artwork. Mm -hmm. You know, they will draw an elephant or, or a bunny say, you know, like, you know, if, if we're working with, with my bunny book and they might draw a bunny who has dragon wings and, you know, is wearing a t-shirt and on a skateboard and, you know, all of the parts are different sizes and, you know, using crazy colors. And they think that it is the absolute most beautiful bunny that's ever been drawn. And it is because it comes from a place of joy. And I think that at a certain point, and it's usually somewhere around the age, you know, 10 to 12, and then carries into adulthood when someone sits down and tries to draw an elephant or a bunny or whatever it is, and it doesn't look like the thing in real life. And then they feel like they're not a good artist. So they, so they stop doing it. Mm -hmm. But when you go to a museum or you look at art online, there's so many different interpretations of how to draw, draw things. And like, you know, like your handwriting or like your signature, everybody draws in a different way. You know, if we were all drawing the bunny and the elephant the exact same way, and it looked like it did at, you know, when we go see it at the zoo, it's, that's not interesting. You know, when it's imperfect, that's what makes it yours. That's what makes it, you know, for you. And if you can concentrate on how you feel when you're, when you're drawing or you're making art rather than what the product looks like, mm. that's the most important thing. And I really like to ask that to, to kids, you know, when I see their artwork, you know, I don't say, oh, that looks really good. I say, how did you feel when you were drawing that? Mm -hmm. You know, and they'll say happy, wonderful, you know, fun, you know, I had fun. I loved it. And so it's more important to concentrate, you know, on that. But in terms of stick figures, stick figures are very, um, I think under, under appreciated <laughs> because, you know, drawing is not necessarily again, like rendering something it's, it's visually communicating an idea. So if you can communicate your idea using stick figures, that's a successful drawing, you know? Okay. Yep. So you can think about it, you know, in, in a lot of different, um, in a lot of different ways, but everybody in their life has used a crayon. Everybody in their life has taken a pencil and dragged it across a paper to make a mark. And all you have to do is keep going, doing that. And that, you know, you can find, something in there that maybe you didn't know was there. Yeah, no, I think that's, I think that's very true. And and I remember being a kid, one of my favorite TV shows, I think it was called Art Attack. It's an English show, so I don't think you would know it. But um, No, I don't, but it sounds like British I would like listeners, it. I think would, would maybe remember it, but I, I think that was the name of it. But if it, that wasn't the name of it, that will trigger someone to tell me what it actually was. Um, but I think, you know, part of the problem is, you know, if I was going to go to draw something, I would have what I wanted it to look like in my head. What, let's say, a natural ability artist would be able to draw just straight off. And then it never comes out that way. Now, that sounds kind of like running where you might see, um, you know, Kipchoge and say, I want to run like that. But you know, just because it doesn't come out like that, your ability, you don't have the ability to run a two hour marathon. It, you know, just disheartens us or we can uh, see someone, like you said, you mentioned about comparing. So tell us about 
uh, the parallels between comparing as an artist, you know, of, of both levels. So someone who isn't considered quote unquote an artist and someone who, you know, like yourself, but also at every level of running, we all, you know, struggle with comparison too. Sure. And just, you know, to use Kipchoge as the example, you know, I know that I will never run <laughs> a two hour marathon. I may never even run a four hour marathon, but that's where I'm at. And I have to meet myself where I'm at. And again, like, how do I feel when I run and how do I feel when mm -hmm. I complete a race? I feel proud of myself mm -hmm. that I finished and the numbers don't really matter. So if you feel happy when you're, you know, maybe it's making art, maybe it's writing, maybe it's creating music, maybe it's dance, any of the arts, you don't have to be, you know, the best in order to get a lot out of it. Mm -hmm. And I think again, you know, being the best is all relative and art is so subjective, but I really encourage people to kind of concentrate how they feel doing these practices, whether it's athletic or artistic, because that's where the joy comes from and the motivation to keep going comes from. Mm -hmm. For sure. Thank you for explaining that so well. And then in an article I read about you just talking about that thing, you kind of said that another way it parallels with art parallels with running is um, you have to trust your plan. You know, um, you have to trust that it's going to work out. It's going to be okay. And, you know, you're running your own race using that as, as both what it actually means and literally kind of a, a metaphor in, um, in art. So tell us what you mean by that. Sure. Well, um, I'm training for my first marathon right now. I'm running New York city in November and, um, you know, I see these big numbers <laughs> on the, on the long runs and I'm not sure if I can do that, but I, I say, you know what, like the person that designed this plan, the coach that I'm working with, you know, says that this is what I should do. And even though, you know, my friend who's also training is following some other plan and I think, Oh, maybe, maybe I should do what she's doing. No, I need to stay in my lane and, and do the plan that was prescribed to me because that's where I'm at. You know, that's where she's at. So she's doing that one. And like in art, you know, if I'm seeing what other friends are doing, I have a lot of friends that make picture books as well. Maybe one of them might start working on, um, a different type of project, like a middle grade graphic novel. Middle grade is kind of like the age, you know, after your like chapter books, kind of getting into that, that type of age, like early teen but that's not where my practices are. So just because they're doing that, I shouldn't feel like I'm missing out or, Oh no, is my portfolio not broad enough? Mm. Am I, am I not going to get the next picture book deal because they want you to work in different genres? You know, should I be doing that? And I think anytime you kind of cross that line where what you are planning for yourself is dictated by what other people are doing, you, you lose your compass and you have to stay, you know, with your own, um, your own compass and what makes sense for you. Sure. Okay. Well, thank you for explaining that. I, d I did wonder what, how that would have been the case, but that, that definitely makes sense. And, and, uh, thank you for explaining. Right. Let's talk about view, uh, from my run a bit more. Do you ever feel like, let's say you've been on a four mile run, you know, quite short, uh, you've got, it's got this picture. It's quite intricate. Uh, do you feel pressure to kind of finish on time or is there kind of, you know, how do you pace yourself essentially to time it right? Um, it really is like pacing in a race because if I know that I only have, you know, say 35 minutes, I will, I will think about rendering it in a way that's maybe less detailed or I'll say, you know, oh, I'm going to use this particular pen because it has like more of a brush tip and it is more forgiving for, you know, the style. And it, you know, if it's, if it's more imperfect than I want it to be, you know, it's kind of okay. And it, and it allows me to work more quickly. Um, I will maybe render it with less detail than it is in reality, or I'll choose, oh, I'm going to do the, you know, the shading with markers instead of paint, because that's a little bit faster. And so I kind of adjust based on that. So I, I definitely take a little time to, to strategize. And I think I would do the same thing in a race, you know, or if I plan to run a certain pace in the first half of the race and that didn't quite work out, I would need to like adjust, you know, as I'm, as I'm going and maybe make some changes. And it's the same thing when I'm making, making the art. Sometimes I get really into it and then I realize, oh no, I only have five minutes left on the timer. <laughs> you know, how am I going to finish this off in a way where I feel like, you know, it looks complete and it's, you know, maybe closer to how I imagined it, you know, in my mind. 
Um, do you ever not finish? Yeah. Oh, sure. Yeah. And there's does plenty that not of time. For you, like, I feel like if, like, for runners, like, let's say you were supposed to do a five mile run and you could only get, I don't know, four, you would be like, oh, God, missed out on that, and it would kind of annoy you the rest of the day. Does it? Does it bother you with that or not? Are you able to let that go? No, I definitely let it go because I set the expectation from the beginning. Like these, these images are, were never meant to be, um, like super perfect or labored over, you know, they're meant to be like visual journal entries of the runs that I do. Mm -hmm. So if that's the amount of time that I have, I mean, I've gotten pretty good at being able to assess what I can finish, you know, in one amount of time. Um, but no, that doesn't really bother me. I mean, there's sometimes where like, I'll screw up and something wasn't exactly how I envisioned it looking, but you know, I just keep, keep going till the timer goes off. And do you think that's your kind of the creative mindset that you have that you're able to kind of like, look at it after that day and say, oh, you know, that was a great representation. Whereas someone who maybe is more of an organizational mindset, kind of very like type A, this is how I'm going to do things they would maybe look at that piece of work and be like, oh, I can still see that missing window or something like that. Do you think it's anything to do with your mindset or do you think that doesn't even come into it? I I would consider myself type A really? in many ways. Yeah, for sure. But again, I think it's because I'm already in the mindset of, you know, my expectations for this project are very different than my expectations would be for like a picture book I'm handing off to a publisher. Okay. So, um, I actually think the unfinished ones are the ones that wind up looking most interesting. Okay. And would you recommend that others give this a try, um, regardless of whether they have traditionally seen themselves as good at art or not? Yeah, I think that there's, you know, a lot of different ways people can incorporate creativity into their athletic practice. Like I've met a lot of followers on Instagram who, um, there was one follower who sort of printed out the data from Strava and then was drawing on top of it, which I thought was really cool. So it was keeping a little journal that way. Um, a lot of people use bullet journals now, mm -hmm. which is kind of like a, a more visual way of blocking out time. And a lot of people decorate you know, their pages in their bullet journal. And maybe that concept can apply to the training journal, you know, mm. where they're tracking all of their runs. So, you know, this is the way for me that it, that it makes sense. And I find joy in incorporating it into my running practice, but that looks, you know, that looks different for everyone. So I would just encourage people, you know, if they are creatively curious, uh, you know, and want to try something like that, just like the first time you put on, you know, running sneakers and, took the first step. That's all you have to do is buy a pen, get a piece of paper and, you know, make the first line. <laughs> That's great. And, uh, actually on that note, um, one of my Patreon, uh, members, Emily wants to know if you can, you will come to Cincinnati to run in the dark with her. So she has an illustration of her run. So you have a request there. So maybe eventually <laughs> Emily can bring you out and you can be her personal illustrator. <laughs> yes. That would be super fun. Thanks, Emily. <laughs> So, um, you know, have you noticed just one more thing about this? What have you noticed about, you know, maybe your appreciation of where you're running? Is it, you know, as runners, we can easily get into the mindset where we're just kind of staring at the floor ahead. We are kind of just trudging our way through. Has this made you see your run with a different perspective because you're looking around at what you see? Absolutely. And that is probably the best side effect of this project is you know, a new appreciation for my surroundings. And, you know, I'm biased. I think New York City is the greatest city ever, <laughs> anywhere. And so I feel very fortunate every day to get to run in New York. And so, you know, see just looking up and seeing beautiful architecture and details or like a a cat in the, in somebody's window, you know, that's staring down all of those things that you pass by every day, but because we're also overscheduled and busy, you know, everyone's face down in their phones. Like I, I'm constantly swerving around people that I call cell phone zombies where like they're face down in the phone and they're just shuffling along, not paying attention. And I think how sad for them, <laughs> you know, that they're missing kind of all this stuff around them. And it really forces you to, 
have this wonderful sensory experience where you're like listening to all of these sounds and seeing all of these things and discovering new things in your neighborhood that maybe you didn't realize were there. And it also kind of gamifies my running a little bit because I'm always thinking about, oh, like, what am I going to draw for this mm-hmm. one? And so do you decide um, during, or do you decide once, as soon as you finish, it's like, okay, it was that. Well, sometimes I'll take more than one photo. Sometimes I'll just, I'll see one thing and I'll be like, yep, that's it. Or sometimes I'll go out with an intention to look for something specific where, you know, I might, I might say, oh, you know, I really want something that is a, is colorful. So I'll purposely look for something extremely colorful or, you know, oh, I want to do a, a architecture today. So I'll specifically look at architecture. So it's kind of, you know, organic, but, um, I do have some, some sense of what maybe I'm looking for. Mm-hmm. And what are some of your favorites? I mean, I know we've obviously, you've mentioned architecture and, uh, there's quite a few of buildings, uh, in your kind of, I don't know if you call it portfolio or the ones that I've seen, but you also have some unique ones that maybe something you wouldn't pick out. Like I saw a, a bunch of cuties, uh, the yeah. little mini oranges. Tell us about some of your favorites. Yeah. So, um, I would say some of my favorites are, the start lines at the races. Yes, yeah. So I'll kind of like, you know, put my hand up and and take a bunch of photos of, you know, everybody waiting at the start line. And to me, anybody who's been in in a road race knows that energy of the start line and kind of the anticipation and the excitement and just, you know, everyone's so happy to be there and, you know, and ready to go for their PR or whatever it is. And so I just love the the feeling that gets, um, portrayed by those moments. And, um, I do love drawing architecture. So I will always be looking for like little details. And, um, just recently I did the gate to the conservatory garden at Mm -hmm. central park. Mm -hmm. And I remember like I was listening to a podcast while I was drawing it and it's really, really detailed. And it made me want to like go out and buy a tinier pen because, (laughs) I got really, really into drawing like all the little like wrought iron details and stuff. So anything that's, you know, that's detailed in architecture, I really like as well. You just mentioned something interesting there though. You, you said you listened to a podcast while you were drawing, so you don't Hmm? have like complete silence to kind of like think and allow things to come out. Like, no, usually when I am drawing, I'm doing it in the evening. Mm -hmm. Um, so I'm, and I'm a mom, I have two kids, they're 11 and a half and eight And so it is a chaotic environment (laughs) and I'm usually like at the edge of my kitchen table, um, you know, drawing them. So I will often pop in earbuds and either listen to music or, um, or put on a podcast while I'm working because it will drown out the sound of my family. (laughs) I'm sorry. I'm sorry, family. (laughs) <laughs> no, absolutely understood. My uh, husband took my daughter out because I do find it difficult to concentrate. So um, I hear you. <laughs> and uh, okay, finally, just to kind of wrap up here about, um, you know, what you do and just uh, how it connects with running. I'm sure people are curious. Uh, are there any books about running that you would love to do kind of uh, being, you know, you yourself being a positive role model to younger children? And Donna gave a great uh, question earlier about that. But uh are there any books, you know, in the works you would love to do about running that, you know, younger kids can kind of get an early start into learning about kind of the, the specialness of it? Yeah. I mean, I have no shortage of ideas. It's always Mm -hmm. the hard, the hard part is like, you know, kind of molding the idea into a, into a thing. So, um, I definitely have like, you know, I, I use Evernote, um, to keep a lot of my ideas and I have sketchbooks of course. So I have a lot of ideas in there and I would definitely love to do something, you know, that's for kids, but I think there's also, you know, stuff for grownups there too. I've never done a book, um, book for grownups. So that'd be fun too. Mm -hmm. So maybe a book about running somehow that way that would be fun yeah yeah that well, would be we fun. will look out for it okay <laughs> we are just going to take a moment to thank our sponsors and we'll be back with the running for real four you enjoying these cool mornings how about the intense workouts that are just as hard as they always were i don't know about you but i always feel like workouts are going to be somehow easy in the fall after a hot summer but they're still well hard 
I still feel beaten up after hard days and after long runs, and I still get sore the next day, but I'm less sore when I have Body Health Perfect Amino to speed up the recovery process. I take a lot of comfort knowing that it is working hard to repair my muscles as soon as I stop running or strength training. Then I can eat my meal, my usual 25 minutes later to fuel up again. I wish I could say I used that time to stretch, for enroll, do mobility and rehab, but let's be realistic. That doesn't always happen. Usually I'm jumping in the shower and trying to get clothes on before Bailey starts crying or I have to do something else on my list. At least I know Body Health Perfect Amino has my back right from the stop of my watch. If you don't believe me, you can try Body Health Perfect Amino with 100% money back guarantee. So if you don't like it or you can't see a difference, you can get your money back. Use coupon code TINA10 for 10% off everything at bodyhealth.com. And if you aren't a fan of the tablets, they also have Perfect Amino XP powder and there's a new mixed berry flavor to try. Remember, code TINA10 will get you 10% off at bodyhealth.com. Earlier in the show, I introduced you to our new sponsor, Bombus. You may remember I did a giveaway with Bombus for my birthday week, and I've been raving about them on social media. Why? Because I just love them. Two years of research and development led to multiple improvements of the sock design, performance, and comfort, including arch support system that gives you extra support where you need it, stay in place technology while not being too loose and they never leave a mark and the seamless toe means that there's no more of that annoying bump on your toes but you want to know the best part one pair sold is one pair donated did you know that socks are the number one most requested item in homeless shelters but you actually can't donate used socks that's why Bombas donates one brand new pair of socks for every pair they sell to date they've sold and donated over nine million pairs Bombas were created for runners, walkers, power loungers, snowboarders, Netflixers, and to me, they feel like you are getting one of those lovely tight squeeze hugs, the ones that just really mean a lot, which I love to give. Some people hate them, but I love them. And here's the bit you want to know. Running for your listeners, get 20% off your first order by going to bombas.com forward slash running for real. That's B-O-M-B-A-S dot com forward slash running for real and you'll get 20% off your first order with code running for real with the number four. All right, Laurie, just four more questions for you. Starting with, tell us about a photo on social media that maybe doesn't show things quite as it seems. On my social media? Yep. It doesn't have to be social media. If you, if you just took a photo and, you know, maybe your kids were smiling, but two minutes before that they were arguing or something. Tell us about a photo, may, especially of running, if you can, that isn't quite what it seems. So I posted a photo on my Instagram when I was on vacation with my family this summer. We um, took a lovely vacation to Hawaii mm. and um, I did... I, I attempted, I should say, <laughs> a 13 mile run a, a completely outside on a volcano, like oh. a literal volcano. And I posted a photo um, where I was like, you know, hands on hips, like power posing. And I was actually like dying of heat. And I was, it was unobstructed sun. Um, and you know, like those survival shows you might come across yeah. in national where it's like that person never should have been out there doing that. And then they had to survive for three days. I, I felt like I was going to be on that, on that <laughs> show. So my power pose did not fully, um, I would say portray the discomfort yeah. <laughs> I had of being like in that heat. And it was really hard to take, um, that photo because I had to stand the phone on lava rocks yeah. and I kept falling, it kept falling over and I tripped and then like gashed my leg and it was, <laughs> Yeah, just a little bit of a hot mess. Sounds about right. That sounds about right. <laughs> okay, what about a running for real moment? Something that only runners will understand, other than obviously view from my run. So I um, just discovered a sports bra hack that I'm really proud of. Okay. So um, I am a runner with boobs, and a lot of um, you know elite runners don't have boobs. <laughs> so um, I can't. You know, I don't. I don't see necessarily that many like, like role models of professional runners that deal with this problem. So I went through all the expensive sport bras. I've bought $90 sports bras and $60, but none, nothing works. I got cheap, 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 $20 sports bras from target. They're more of like, um, they don't have any like hooks or anything, but they're more like a tight, like crop top yeah, kind I of, know what you mean. Yep. but I wear two of them. <laughs> yep. 
And it's the best thing ever because there's no hooks, you know, grabbing or stabbing, no chafing. It makes them flat as a pancake and it's awesome. So I highly recommend it. I do actually do the same thing. Uh, I did that this morning on my run. Um, (laughs) But the only problem I found with that is some of them have the liner that can still, if I have two of them on, it pushes them down enough that it chafes, like it rubs. So I have to... (laughs) This is way have too much re- information. Have to like position them correctly so that they don't right. rub against the um the the material. Well, the ones that I have have removable like okay. cu- padded cups, so I just rip those things out right away. Okay. And then okay. I don't and then I don't have that problem. Well, I yeah, I definitely can vouch that that <laughs> does work. Um and uh, the double sports bra thing is a great thing to do. And I know exactly what you're talking about with those target ones. That is a good idea. Uh so for anyone else listening, give that a try. I don't know if you have tried it, uh Laurie, but I have to just pick up the Lululemon and light one more time. Uh I just love that bra and it I know it's a hundred dollars, I know it's expensive. But for me, I've bought four of them because they are the only ones wow, that actually work. I haven't tried that one, but there's yeah. a Lululemon right near my studio. So maybe I'll go check it out. They are expensive. I get that. But for me, it's so worth it. And they are exactly the same level of quality. They haven't shrunk or dif- disfigured in any way at all. So I highly recommend them. And I'm not, they have not paid me to say that. I have bought every one of those bras myself. <laughs> okay. Wow. Um, all right. Finally, uh, well, no, I've got through two more. Yeah. Uh, what about a high moment for you? I think it would be getting my first medal at that Brooklyn half marathon. Mm-hmm. Yep. For sure. I felt on top of the world and I, you know, my kids were proud of me and they could, you know, they were super excited. So that was really fun. Did you go jump in the ocean afterwards? I did not jump in the ocean. I think I jumped <laughs> over to get a hot dog. I think is what I, what I That's did. just as good. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And finally, what do you tell yourself when you're on the start line of race? Or what are you going to tell yourself when you start New York? I think I'm going to say, have a great time. Enjoy every minute. High five all the kids and don't get hurt. <laughs> get hurt. Okay. I've been, yeah, I've been working really hard to stay injury free. So I think that's going to be my mantra. Well, hopefully, um, you know, it all goes well and that, uh, start line mantra does pay off and you have a wonderful time at New York. What a way to do your first marathon. That is amazing. Um, Laurie, how can people firstly find out more about you and then tell us maybe a few of the titles of some of your favorite books for people to uh, check out if they do have kids? Sure. On Instagram, I'm at Lori Richmond Draws, and my website is lauriedraws.com. And um, my picture books, my most recent picture book is Bunny Staycation, Mama's Business Trip. Um, I also have one called Pax and Blue that I wrote and illustrated. And actually, I have a Halloween title um, that I illustrated that's coming, or it's actually already out. Um, and it's called Skelly's Halloween. Um, and I've illustrated a bunch more too. I, I think Bailey's a fan of a hop is up, right? Yeah. Yep. Yep. Although That's that one is definitely show. a baby book, isn't it? It's, uh, it's, well, it's good for babies, but also kids that are just learning to read independently yeah. on yeah, their own. For sure. Good for yeah, that too. I could see that. Yeah. But yeah. She likes mm-hmm. that one. Um, and, uh, it's, it's very cute. So yeah. we have, we have that, that one bunny staycation. And then I think you also kindly sent, one more, which was oh, maybe uh, oopsie, oopsie do. do. Yeah, yes. I like that one too. Yeah, that's all about making mistakes, which we all do. And yes. it's I love the message, and it's that one's a cute one, really yeah. bright okay. and cheerful. Well, Laurie, thank you so much for coming on, sharing your story, giving us a different way to think about life. Because I think, again, so often we put ourselves into one bucket or the other, and we think, well, I'm not even going to try doing that because I'm just not creative or you know, for artistic people, I'm not even going to bother trying to do a sport because I'm not athletic. So thank you for helping us blend the two. I appreciate you and all that you've done and uh, look forward to seeing any new titles in the future. Thank you for having me, Tina. My friends, if you have a minute and you could leave a review on your favorite podcast player, Apple Podcasts, aka iTunes, Stitcher, Overcast, Pocket Class, Spotify, or whatever else, podcast player you use to listen to this podcast or if you would subscribe to this podcast you will help me get out in front of new runners to make our tribe even bigger and even better it might not seem like you as one person can make a difference but really it helps a lot and it shows me you appreciate the hard work I put in for those thank you so much 
Oh, isn't she great? I just loved Laurie and I love that conversation and just such a cool concept of thinking about what you could draw in the time it took you to go for a run. Although I, I just feel like if I tried to do that, I would just have a very enhanced stick figure, as I mentioned, or something that I would end up getting so frustrated with. I love that she can find peace with wherever it ends up right at the time at the end, rather than scrambling. It's it's just really cool to think about. And part of me is kind of tempted to to think about it or at least kind of look around of what I would do. And I have been thinking about that a lot the last few weeks. I would love to see if any of you decide to try doing a view from my run, please share it with us. That would be so cool to see. And uh, I look forward to hopefully getting some of them in my email. So you can find links to everything we talked about today in the show notes at tinamuir.com forward slash episode 83. And you will notice I had some questions from Patreon members in there today. And I have to say, your questions are so good. And I would love to hear your suggestion for questions for guests in future. You get to know up to six weeks in advance. And as a Patreon member, that gives you time to think about it as well. You can find links in the show notes or from my homepage on how to sign up as a Patreon member. And as for next week, we have Steph Bruce on the show ahead of her and many of you are racing the New York Marathon. And Steph has been absolutely on fire lately. We talk about a lot of her recent successes and wins, but also we dive deeper into some topics that we haven't discussed before and I haven't heard her talk about. So be sure to subscribe to the Running For Real podcast so that it comes right to you next Friday. And remember, this is the week of giveaways to celebrate 1 million downloads of the Running For Real podcast. So go to my Instagram at Tina Muir 88 or my Facebook page, uh, facebook.com forward slash real Tina Muir. And you can be one of three winners of a huge package of goodies from previous guests and sponsors. So don't miss out. Hope you have a great week and I'll see you then. Thanks for listening to the Running For Real podcast. Be sure to check out tinamuir.com for show notes and even more helpful running information.